Okay, we're live. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining the Status Aviation for our first ever webinar. Uh, today, we'll be discussing the Bachelor of Commerce in Business Management uh, in the elective stream of aviation management, which is done by DaVinci in association with Status Aviation. Uh, just a couple of house rules before we get going. Uh, for all the panelists, just make sure that you're please muted unless it's your uh, turn to chat, just so we don't have any uh, chatter above um, whichever speaker might be speaking at that current time. And to all our guests, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A feature uh, that this webinar has at the bottom. And you can ask questions as we go along, um, or you can just put the questions uh, later when we do the Q&A after all our speakers um, have concluded. Uh, today, we're fortunate enough to have been joined by uh, Rafir Ali Dwaba from GFPA Foundation, Mike Klopp from Absolute Aviation, Percy van Staden and François Minard, who are both from Status Aviation. Uh, François will be joining us in a minute. He's just actually currently doing a facilitation of our students. Uh, Sarah Leob, who is going, who's one of our graduating students, and Mario Lundman, who's a representative from da Vinci, the Da Vinci Institute. And thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to hearing from all our speakers. So how we're we currently going to continue or our schedule for today, uh, we'll first begin with Mario Lundman from Da Vinci Institute, um, after which we'll have Percy van Staden, and then François Minard, Rifiru Lidwaba, Sarah, and then Mike Clark uh, at, uh, at the end, saving the best for last, Mike. Um, and then afterwards, we'll be open for a Q&A session for the speakers that are still available. And I think that'll be it. So, Mario, uh, hope you're ready. I'm going to ask you to unmute now. Uh, thank you, uh, Cedric. And good afternoon to uh, all the participants. Um, like as we introduced, uh, my name is Mario Lundman. I'm the Dean of uh, Program Design at the Da Vinci Institute. And uh, the BCOM program we're discussing today is one of the programs that I actually took responsibility for designing. So I was asked just to give you a sense of how the program was put together, some of the thought behind it, where the aviation components fit in, and how it's all put together. So first off, uh, if you're not familiar with the Da Vinci Institute, so we are a fully accredited private higher education institution. So that means that we are, our programs are created with the uh, Council of High, on Higher Education, as well as SACWA, and we are registered with the DHET. So we are effectively a private university. Um, the BCOM program that we're discussing today was recently re-accredited by the, the Council on Higher Education. So from a long liberty and from a value perspective, uh, that always bodes well if a program has gone through several accreditation cycles and I think the program is now on its third accreditation cycle so there's definitely long liberty there and there's confidence in the regulators around the quality of this particular program. During the most recent re-accreditation cycle the program went through a bit of a, um, a change in regard to its uh, curriculum structure. The program now looks uh, from a core and fundamental perspective more like you would expect a traditional BCOM program to look like, but with that being said, the Da Vinci managerial leadership uh, component uh, that is unique to Da Vinci and on which we pride ourselves as a differentiator in the market when it comes to other business programs are now interweaved throughout uh, the curriculum. And um, while we, we still have the modules that you would usually expect, like economics, financial management, accounting, etc., everything is infused with the Da Vinci-ness, and the Da Vinci-ness is the proprietary uh, managerial leadership framework that looks at um, the, the management uh, of any particular industry through the lens of technology, innovation, people, and systems. So, Within that framework, there's a very good fit with um, the aviation modules, which uh, forms a part of what we call an elective stream. So an elective stream simply means that while you have core and fundamental components, it speaks to the sort of core aim of a program, which is uh, managerial leadership within this technolo uh, technology innovation people and systems framework. Uh, 
students then branch off into a elective stream, which effectively is the applied components of a study to a particular industry. Now, the BCom currently has 10 of these uh, streams of application or electives, if you will, and aviation management is one of those elective streams. Uh, a third of, uh, from a curriculum structure perspective, about a third of the credit values are allocated to, uh, to the aviation modules. And uh, yeah, since we, I'm not sure there's any questions, I don't know how much depth we should go into, but I think that is the, the sort of general idea is that students progress through the core and fundamental uh, modules or programs three, three years long uh, and full-time study, part-time study uh, is longer depending on uh, the particular group that's enrolled for, um, uh, uh, for this particular program. Uh, just in regard to the, what sort of makes DaVinci unique further is our teaching and learning approach, which is firmly rooted in mode two. So for those of you that don't know what mode two is, when I initially Googled mode two, and uh, from an aviation perspective, you might find this funny, mode two is uh, uh, a, a term that is generally used in aviation to discuss uh, radio frequency. So mode one and mode two, I'm not sure if I'm using it correctly, but that's initially what I thought when we were speaking about mode two, but mode two within a teaching and learning uh, context refers to a new methodology of knowledge generation, which is firmly rooted in problem probing, as opposed to a very strict focus on discipline learning. So what that simply means is that we in a traditional university, uh, you would learn within the, the, the scope of a particular discipline, so be it economics, etc., and your assessments would be rooted within the scope of that particular discipline. In mode two, we focus on the problem first and then gather the disciplines or the tools rather that you have gathered through uh, the rest of your uh, curriculum to solve a workplace uh, uh, place based problem. So um, very simply put, what makes DaVinci unique in that sense is that uh, we put the problem first and we help students to develop solutions that is unique to their particular workplace context. So we don't use case studies, we, uh, we don't focus on theory testing, uh, our entire teaching and learning methodology is, is rooted in the problem that the student is facing in his or her workplace. And then we help that student to gather the right tools across disciplines to approach that particular problem. So that in a nutshell is mode two, and that is our uh, primary uh, philosophy when it comes to uh, teaching and learning. Okay, my um, question from Greg Parkins, who's asking about the relevance of the program and um, what relevance does the program have based on its accreditation globally? Okay, so as I started, uh, the program is fully accredited locally. Now, there is no such thing as an international accreditation, and I'd just like to explain what that means. Um, because every country has its own national qualification framework, portability between institutions uh, across borders is purely based on the uh, the external institutions evaluation of your program. First, the evaluation they do is they, uh, they need to confirm whether that program is locally accredited. So from a recognition perspective, that is the first check that they do. And then they look deeper, they look at curriculum, etc. So uh, there's often a miscommunication in the market when people advertise their qualifications as internationally recognized. That simply means that the program is locally accredited and therefore is subject to evaluation by a, a institution in a different country. Uh, but the individual recognition of a program resides with that external company in the, whatever country it may be. So the best you can look for locally for a program or internationally is to make sure that, that program is fully accredited and recognized within the country where the qualification is issued. And uh, that is the best position you could put yourself in for potential international recognition. I'm not sure that answers it fully, but uh, it's, it's, it's often worrying when we see programs being advertised as internationally recognized. Uh, 
there is no guarantee of international recognition. Like I said, the best you can do is to make sure that all the local accreditations are applied. Okay, Mario, thank you very much for that one. Uh, let me just see. Uh, still be able to do this course here. Okay, we'll answer this question at the end, but we've got to go. Actually, I'll answer now. I've got a question from Dustin who says he's a former student of Da Vinci and graduated last year in BCom Business Management. Uh, would he still be able to do this course and get accredited? So, essentially, with these credits. Uh, so just to understand, does that mean that he did not complete the course? Uh, from my understanding, he graduated last year already, but he did a separate BCom business management. Well, this is essentially the same qualification. Yeah. So the qualification was re-accredited. So if he completed a BCom in business management with the electives in aviation, it would be equivalent to what, what we're talking about today. So the program went through a re-accreditation process, um, which was actually only officially applied uh, this year, but we have been enrolling students since May 2019 on the, on the new curriculum. Uh, it's a different curriculum, but essentially it contains the same, uh, the same content. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Mario, appreciate it. Uh, okay. And now after this, we're going to be joined by uh, Percy van Staden from Status Aviation. Thank you, Cesar. Um, you have side of my screen? Yeah, I can see it. All right. Yeah, thanks, Mario. Um, it's quite a good overview of um, sort of the journey of the qualification up to this point. Um, I think uh, before I get into what I, what I intended on speaking on in the beginning was, uh, um, I just want to start by, um, Almost sort of the word of caution in the sense that um, we often see the questions come out and um, I, I think it speaks to the concern or the, the value add of the degree as something to fall back on, you know, in case you lose your medical um, and someone, you know, people want some, some accredited qualification um, for that instance. And, um, but, you know, if, if we look at, what uh, Da Vinci is about and, and the, this association, the purpose of this qualification. Um, you know, we, um, we really set out to, to, instead of having just a certificate, to actually uh, journey with the student and to actually, um, I think one of, the, one of the slogans of Da Vinci is, you know, cultivating man managerial leaders. And I think, um, when you engage with with education, you, you either have the, the option of going for something that is uh, just a certificate, and you, 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 your aim is to to fall back on that. But you know, in, in reality, you know, you don't want you to just move backwards. You know, we want you to to have a mission and to move forward. And uh, that's why I just quickly um, pulled up the slide with um, uh, a, a quote from uh, Mr. Mandela saying, "You know, education is the most powerful weapon with which you can." Uh, change the world. So um, when we set out to to develop the first version of this qualification, and we, when we chose Da Vinci as a partner, and uh, the fit was was great because um, the 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 challenge that we were approaching was wasn't necessarily something uh, uh, where we we tried to create a certificate for people to. To fall back on in case they lose their medical, we, we we what we're trying to address is is the lack of collaboration in the industry and and um, you know having done uh, having been involved in various sectors of the industry, Mercedes Aviation, um, we have quite a large platform of pilots uh, on our question bank platform, about seven and a half thousand users, and we we do quite a bit in the ground trading space. Um, we we found that a lot of this the industry is is siloed and it's a very competitive industry. So um, the reason for this qualification wasn't necessarily just to to provide a certificate that would make your CV look good. It, it's really to partner with the various players in the industry. Um, initially, uh, mostly pilots, but um, as of now, we're seeing. Um, 
you know, participants from various uh, sectors, um, to partner with them in their learning journey and to understand their, mi their mission in aviation. Um, uh, Murray didn't speak much about uh, the work-based challenge module, for example, that uh, Divincy offers, and it's, it forms um, part of the curriculum whereby students are um, basically asked to identify a challenge in the industry and, and come up with a solution for that uh, while they journey through the qualification. Uh, and I think uh, Sarah might be speaking on that a bit later on, on her specific journey. But um, what I would actually like to challenge um, the, the, the attendees with is, is that, you know, given the fact that, you know, where we are as an industry, we, we, we find ourselves in a space where the whole industry lost their medical, you know, and everything just stopped. Uh, and, you know, knowing aviation and, and um, if you go through the, some of the content, which Francois will, will cover at, at a later stage, um, you, you'll understand that aviation is, is basically a, a precursor for other industries. And that puts a responsibility on us as, as leaders and, and um, players within the industry to, to you know, reconstruct this industry as soon as possible, to, to not just uh, uh, you know, take on these challenges as, as um, you know, something that we will use in the future. Uh, the time is really now, and, and uh, we need to look at what our mission is and effectively uh, start using this education tool that we have um, to change and rebuild this industry. And, and, and that's why this specific group or group of potential students, to me, uh, holds a lot of potential, and I'm quite excited to see what comes from this next intake because um, I would say there's a lot of opportunity to address challenges and to actually, uh, you know, facilitate this collaboration that we've that we've been working towards creating, and uh, it's almost I almost want to use the term that our, our hand has been forced. You know, we have to start working together in a more meaningful way to come up with solutions. Um, so, um, in terms of the qualification. Um, the reason we chose the Da Vinci Association or why that fits so well is because the Da Vinci shares this philosophy uh, of journeying with um, with the students uh, on the uh, initially we, we had a phrase where they said that they'd partner with you on your learning journey and um, that's why I, what I'd what I'd like to ask uh, the attendees is if you would in the comments section just maybe share a bit of what your mission is in aviation and um, let us understand that because um, I think with this group going forward, we'd like to especially, uh, you know, give a lot of focus to that um, to, to see, you know, what sort of value we can, we can get from the students. I, I know we've, in the past, we've, we've had some challenges in, in, in the workplace challenge space, specifically within that module where, um, you know, pilots and, and uh, ATC and air traffic managers were in, uh, um, we're in the same room and they actually managed to solve some real world issues um, at, uh, you know, uh, as, as first, second year students, uh, just by having that open space um, where, they, where they can um, uh, collaborate. And what we will basically do with our modules is give you the insights of, of what the Aviation Valley Train is about, what, what, um, uh, what aviation management is about, and um, the association with Vinci really provides the accredited framework for for this education to actually have a certificate, um, and um, they the the, the Vinci ness that uh, Maria spoke of um, uh, creates that that space where where managerial leadership is cultivated. So um, that's really why why this uh, association exists it is to create that platform for collaboration uh, with education as a tool um, so i hope that we, when you look at the rest of the modules uh, have that in mind uh, it's not just about the certificate it is accredited we uh, the, the qualification is accredited and um, uh, in that in that way 
you know, you do have the certificate to fall back on, but I want to employ you to basically use this opportunity uh, to, to empower yourself uh, to uh, basically fulfill your mission in aviation. So does that, does that more or less cover what you wanted me to cover? <laughs> yeah, sure it does. <laughs> uh, thank you very right. much. Uh, unfortunately, just in the nick of time, uh, Francis has finished his uh, solicitation, so he can get going with uh, letting us know about the aviation modules, Francois. All right, uh, thanks for the introduction. Sorry for being late, everyone. Um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen. I'll that it works, and uh, if you guys can get me on the presenter view. Uh, Cesar, can you confirm that you can see my screen? Uh, yes, I can see your screen. All right, perfect. So basically, um, yeah, sorry for being late. Uh, like Cesar mentioned, I've just come from a facilitation and our discussions carried on a bit longer than, than expected. Got into some good content and uh, sorting out some issues with the assessments. But um, basically, today I'm just going to work through very quickly, I saw there was a time limit and we're trying to keep this under an hour. So I'm just going to quickly go through the actual modules from the aviation side. Um, just basically talk through what each of them entails and uh, what we cover in each of the modules. And then I'll quickly just run through a new delivery method um, where we basically have changed from a, um, you know, especially with the amount of the COVID situation, we've changed to a a much more online based and interactive setup uh, for the new modules coming out. So basically to get started, um, I've just copied this from our website, but it's basically just a quick overview of the year one, year two and year three. We've got aviation management 1A, which is introduction to aviation management, uh, 1B, which is an introduction to the aviation regulatory environment. So the first year is really just an introductory a sort of step to get everyone aligned. You know, we've got students from all over that aren't necessarily in aviation. Um, so it really covers all the base aspects of, um, you know, the frameworks and, and how aviation works and the supply chains and, and all those sorts of aspects um, to get everyone on the same page. And, and even for those veterans, it, it might um, cover some basic aspects that you might not have even been involved in as an aviator. Um, and yet too, we start focusing specifically on, on, on you know, shifting towards management um, where with airline air management and economics. We also look at uh, SHRC or SHREC, um, which is a safety, health, um, risk, environment, and quality sort of module. Um, when we go through operations, optimizations through human factors. Uh, then the third, I'm quickly just going through this because I'll, I'll go through each module specifically or separately uh, soon. So I'm going to cover this in more detail, but basically year three, we're doing future trends in aviation, integrated aviation management systems and strategic marketing in aviation. Um, you'll notice at the bottom, there's uh, the titles for credits. Uh, it's 30 credits in year one, 50 credits in year two and 40 credits in year three. Um, and the entire program is a 360 credit program. So those give you an idea of, of what portion these aviation specific um, modules take up of the degree. I think it was 130 degrees, 130 credits, 120 credits, sorry. Um, but that's not to say that in your business modules, you will also not be applying that knowledge to aviation. So these are just very aviation specific, but, but the application of knowledge is always important in all modules. So you'll have opportunity to apply the aviation concepts as well in, in the other business modules that you do. Um, if we move on to the module specifically, so year one, um, as mentioned before, we've got introduction to aviation management. So the purpose here is to provide a broad foundational knowledge of the aviation industry. Um, and it also provides an overview of the role and function of the world aviation organizations, um, both local and international. The aviation value chain as an overview and the demands of the current affairs in aviation as it applies to the value chain and um, these organizations. Um, essentially, some of the contents uh, leading from this is we go through the evolution of aviation, the history, the impacts. Um, we look at how aviation evolves and how different innovations and, and different influences from the outside actually affect aviation. Um, we also look at, you know, like I mentioned before, the role of aviation organizations, the value chain. And I've included this here. Um, I'm sure we'll be sharing these slides, and you can obviously this this will also be recorded, so you can come back to this, but. I'm just sharing the learning outcome. So if you read through this, I'm not going to do it in this session. 
if you read through this, it also give you a very good idea of what you'll be able to do after completing the module. So what your understanding will be where you'll be at. So that, that's really the, um, you know, as I mentioned there, on successful completion of this module, you should be able to, and, and this really gives you an idea of that. So if you want to have a bit more of an in-depth look at each module, then I suggest just um, with a video that will be shared later, or um, I'm sure I'll be able to share my slideshow as well with, with, uh, with the group. Uh, see so if you can just confirm that later on. But basically, I'll be able to share this with you guys somehow. So you can actually go and have a look at what the outcomes are for each module if you want to um, have a look at that yourselves. Um, for AVM 1B, um, this is the introduction to the aviation regulatory environment. Now, as you may know, uh, regulations are a critical part of aviation. It's, it encompasses all different aspects of what we do in aviation. Um, so it's always a consideration. So it's important to understand the framework in which we operate as aviators. So basically the purpose of this module is to provide, provide an overview of the legislation governing the aviation industry and you know as it's laid down by aviation regulators to ensure competent and effective aviation operation, operations in a complex aviation environment. So as, as a manager you need to understand how regulations affect you basically. Um, module contents we go through general aviation law um, as an overview. So obviously it's not a law subject where we look at the specific regulations but we um, we generate that understanding so that you know where to look and you know how the framework works. We look at how regulations uh, were enacted through conventions, um, uh, private and governmental bodies. Uh, we look at service providers of the aviation industry, people in aviation, liabilities of aviation, all, all of this relating to the regulatory environment and uh, new developments as well. Um, you know, so stuff like we, we look at growing technologies and other regulations for that is forming. So it's not just about past regulations, but about future regulations that might affect us. I'm sure that's going to be quite relevant with the uh, pandemic at the moment. I'm sure a lot of new regulations are going to be coming up um, that we're also going to have to all incorporate and look at. So it's, it's understanding how that framework works and how that would fit and how that affects your, you know, your environment and your organizations. Once again, I'm, I'm including the outcomes here, but this is something that you'll have to go through yourself just in the interest of time. Um, for year two, we then start moving into airline management and economics. So it's quite a big module. Um, this provides a knowledge and understanding of an integrated airline operations center. So it's, it's really focusing on, on managing the operations of an airline. Um, it goes into the roles and functions of the three major sectors in aviation, which are airlines, airports, and air traffic. Um, so it looks at all three of those and then really looks at how they interact um, how they work together to actually um, improve the aviation industry and how they are dependent on each other and, and interconnected. And we also look at maintenance, repair, and overall um, from an airline uh, perspective. Um, we also then delve into airline economics, um, which provides a knowledge and understanding of the interrelated nature of air transport and other sectors of the aviation economy. Um, our basic model of content is related to the purpose, you know, airline management, we look at airport management, air traffic management, uh, the different carrier models, costing models for airlines, you know, less financial and, and um, you know, routine considerations. We look at maintenance, repair, and overall for the fleet, um, airline economics, crew management, and aircraft management. Um, once again, putting the outcomes here, you guys can review this afterwards. And for 2B, um, basically the safety model, it covers safety, health, risk, environment, and quality. So this provides a foundational knowledge and understanding of the elements inherent in Shrek or Shrek. And um, also uh, talks about accountability, compliance, and control. Um, it also covers the role of visible felt leadership um, you know, in the context of safety, health, environment, risk, and quality. And we also, uh, in detail, cover the organizational maturity levels um, when it comes to safety culture. In um, our basic module contents, once again, relates to that. We talk about shirt principles in aviation, safety and health management in aviation, risk management in aviation, environmental management in aviation, quality management in aviation. Um, basically, all those different aspects that uh, SHRC stands for, uh, we cover in the module itself. So then our final module for year two, um, operations optimization through human factors. So this is the people element of the, of the system. Um, 
And this teaches the fundamental concepts of human factors in aviation. Um, it also gives a knowledge and understanding of the difficulty faced by aviation role players in clinching human factor values in aviation organizations. And then it also relates back to human factor implications in safety. Um, yeah, so these modules are a little bit uh, cross pollinated for a reason, you know, they're all related to each other. And sorry for going through this so quickly, I'm just trying to stick to my 10 minute education. <laughs> um, the basic module content is uh, contemporary human factor concepts. We've got human factors management and organization, human factors models, history of human factors in aviation, as well as human centered aviation automation um, as chapters in that module. Um, for year three, sorry, I'm actually just missing my year three slides here. Um, Actually, I'm not sure where that went. So let's see if it's that's actually raised change. Um, so let's just quickly go to uh, if you don't mind. Sorry, I actually I'm not sure what's going on with my presentation. So let me see if I've got the updated one here. Um, failing that, I'm just going to quickly run you through what I'll do instead. Uh, let's quickly just go through on the study guide. Sorry, this guys, I guess these things happen sometimes. So basically, if we go to uh, this is this is one of the study guides. So this is something that you'll be presented on each module. But basically, I'm just going to go through the third year modules in this sense. But we've got future trends in aviation for aviation management uh, 3A, um, and I'll uh, share these slides. But the learning outcomes are as indicated here. The content we actually go through, um, I'll just use the table of contents as a reference. We basically go through the trends in the global aviation industry. Um, you know, we look at different things, you know, sort of the changes in how we, you know, generate revenue. It's going to be relevant in the pandemic now as well. I think some of the, the models of how we, um, you know, the aviation trends are going to change again, you know. Uh, in a similar way to how safety and security all changed within um, aviation when the 9-11 attacks happened. These major events have a big impact on the trends that we follow in aviation. We also in this module uh, look at drivers of change in the aviation industry and we look at the future scenarios of aviation in 2035 which was originally presented by IATA. Um, so we look at you know new frontiers, you know, what we need to do for a sustainable future. We look at uh, potential resource wars uh, in future and, and, and global platforms and, and really just covering, you know, what lies in the future of aviation. So we try to keep this module quite relevant and up to date in that sense as well. And I think we're going to have to incorporate a lot of aspects from the pandemic that's currently happening in this, in this module. Obviously, if we start now, three years down the line, we'll probably be uh, further into that, but I think there'll still be things that are, um, that we need to be considered, you know, as, as drivers of change that is that is happening. Um, let me just bring up my the other study guide for three B. So three B. Um, just slides okay. Apologies for this. Sorry, I had the slideshow ready to go, but it seems part of my work wasn't saved. Um, the uh, module three B is the integrated aviation management system. So this focuses on the application and integration of interrelated essential structures within aviation. Basically what this forms down to is, um, if you've had, if you had any dealings with the CIA, you would know what a, a safety management system is, a quality management system. It essentially deals with all these different, so you know, safety management system, security management system, quality management system, enterprise risk management system, supply management systems, and environmental management systems. But those systems on their own aren't really enough um, to have an efficient running organization because they are very siloed and specific to um, their own roles and outcomes. So what this module teaches is how to integrate into those systems, how to have a, an effective integrated aviation management system. Um, so that's essentially the purpose of this model. Then finally on the module 3C, if I quickly go down here, the purpose of this module, it's strategic marketing and aviation, first of all, and it deals with the application of marketing scenarios and strategies in global economies to achieve competitive aviation operations in the aviation market. Um, we cover aspects such as cost base and revenue generation strategies, um, 
We also look at principles of product development and differentiation uh, from a marketing perspective, as well as segmentation uh, in marketing. So sort of using customer data to, uh, to start to know your customer and to tailor products towards them. Um, what we look at in this module, if we look at the table of contents here, um, we look at uh, PESEL analysis, so that looks at your different environment and factors, so it's political, economical, or economic, social, technological, and legal, as well as environmental. We also look at the five forces that shape, shape industry competition. Um, and we sort of look at that in depth because that, that really informs your, your strategic marketing um, you know, approach, is, is to look at what sort of uh, aspect you use to, 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 to be competitive. Uh, we also look at SWOT analysis to identify strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats um, in your own organizations. And we then use, uh, or discuss and, and analyze the different competitive marketing strategies and how that applies to your organization. Um, you know, that includes things like, uh, you know, low, you know, those, those airline models that we talked about earlier, like low cost and, and, and best cost. And we, we look at different niches. We look at the marketing mixes, your product development and differentiation. Um, it's really just following up on the, uh, you know, from the five forces there. And then we also look at the marketing implementation plan for aviation organizations, how you would go about actually um, implementing a plan that you, you generate based upon all your research with regards to the strategies, the forces, and all your differentiation strategies. So yeah, so that, that basically covers the, um, the presentation that I had in terms of the modules. Uh, apologies for the, the, the part at the end there with the third year modules that I didn't have the slideshow already for you. Um, it seems that they've been missing or corrupted somehow. But moving on from that, I just want to have a quick discussion on the delivery. We won't have time to do much here, but basically we present each module over a six to eight week period, depending on the credit allocation. Um, so Sarah, I know you, you were just through the course, but basically um, this has changed since you went through the course. So um, we're basically doing a six to eight week period now um, where we break it up into three or four facilitations that happens every week. So there's a constant communication between you and the facilitator where everyone's involved and we, we use uh, uh, our own platforms to, to conduct these facilitations. Um, you know, it's either a Zoom or we're, we're busy implementing, uh, you'll see a little sneak peek there as a screenshot, a new system where, you know, it's almost like this webinar where people can chat, but obviously everyone has mic microphone access, you know, documents can be shared, all that sort of stuff, um, you know, handouts are presented. So the idea is it's an interactive session where everyone is involved. Um, it's not just a slideshow presentation that's presented, it's a trivial involved discussion around all the different uh, concepts and, 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 and content around the uh, module. We also then have forum discussions that happen weekly. Um, this also happens on a platform, but basically where it's a chat where we can have discussions outside of the facilitation. So it's, it's you know, questions are presented, students have discussions internally. Um, as facilitators, we also get involved in those discussions and, and guide those discussions. Um, we then also have weekly screencasts. So every one of those weeks, we have a screencast that, that that specifically covers the content. So this will be a typical um, you know, classroom presented um, lesson. So we'll have lessons on each one of those sections or, you know, spread up over the six to eight week period. Um, and that covers the content essentially. And then we also have, uh, you know, we, we've got a, a place where resources are shared, you know, so you, I, I often what I do is if I find some interesting research, I'll share it with the group and everyone can get involved and look at the research and incorporate it into their actual assessments. And so it's just a, a nice platform that we use now to share information to, to be a lot more interactive. Um, so those are some of the positive changes that we've made, yeah. Um, we also, uh, alluding to that is, is, I just took some random screenshots here of some of the discussions and stuff, but basically it's a platform like this where we, where we share notifications, we can talk, you know, each student can talk to any other student, um, each student can talk directly to the facilitator, we can create groups on the system where we have group discussions together. So it's really just an interactive thing, um, you, you, there's apps on your phone you can download, so you can get notified whenever I post a notification, for example, as a facilitator, so you're always in the loop. It's not something you have to go and log into every day to see what's going on. It pushes to your phone, to your device. So it's really neat little programs that we, we, we you know, we, we're really trying to make the best use of technology to, to aid in learning. And then the idea is to really get everyone to learn from each other as well, because 
Uh, we don't just learn from our facilitators and our lecturers. We learn from our engagements with each other. And, 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 and you know, with, in this program, what typically happens is we will have a lot of different people from different backgrounds. One person might be a pilot. One person might be uh, an ops manager. Another person, you know, might be into the document control space, for example. Uh, Sarah did, for example. Um, and all those different perspectives, if the students start communicating with each other and if that knowledge is shared, it really aids in learning to understand different perspectives in the aviation industry. So we try and uh, encourage collaborative learning in that sense. Um, then uh, we also, with the marking of assessments, and uh, Sarah, I knew you were going to be in this session today, so I hope you don't mind that I shared a, an excerpt of one of your <laughs> assessments here. Um, but basically, this is just to, to give you an idea of what we'll typically have is, is your assessments are marked. So we, we mark it, it, it's submitted by a turn it in, it's checked for plagiarism, all that stuff. But basically, when it's marked, the, the facilitators then have the opportunity to actually comment on the um, specific the document itself so you can actually annotate and highlight and and then indicate okay look you need to do this this is the part where you maybe you've gone wrong so it's, it's a lot more interactive the feedback in that sense um it's not just a general commentary you can even really delve down into specific parts where i can say okay but this particular word you used here isn't correct or that particular sentence doesn't make sense or and so we give you that sort of feedback um so the marking of assessment that that's how that works um, uh, just as an example and i think that concludes my portion. Um, like I said, I, I rushed through it now because I knew I wasn't going to keep to my 10 minutes. <laughs> but basically, if you guys have any questions, um, our team is happy to answer. I, I wasn't, because I'm late, I'm not sure what the exact parameters are for, for getting Q&As done in this session, but um, you can get in touch if your questions aren't answered on this forum. You can always go to our website and just contact us through the form. Maybe just mention that you come from the webinar. And our team will definitely be happy to assist you. Um, alternatively, though, I'm sure our team will also share other resources where you can actually get in contact with us. If you have any more questions regarding how we deliver this module, uh, what the contents are, if you have, you know, if you want to see those study guides that we presented and, and really look in depth at, at what the content is, that sort of thing, you can always request that from us. Our team will be happy to help. Um, you know, in case I missed anything that, or if, if I didn't really answer any of the, the questions that you had pre-baked here. Yeah. Um, but that essentially concludes it from my end. Um, yeah, Cesar. Hi, Francis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. And now we're going to be hearing from uh, Ruth Bilwe from the GFPA Foundation. Hi, um, thanks, Cesar, and good afternoon, everyone. So for the past few months or rather a few weeks i've been asked um, the following questions what courses can i recommend for pilot who wants to diversify their skills should we still continue with our pilot licenses given the context and you know what is currently hoping, uh, happening in the industry and how do we decide on what to do next so i'm going to try to answer all the three questions um, using examples of my own career journey so I've been in the aviation industry for the past uh, 20 years. Uh, I joined the industry directly from university where I completed uh, a science degree. I majored in microbiology and biochemistry, nothing related to the aviation industry, but it did give me the skills and sort of gave me a platform where I can use some of the knowledge in that degree. For example, the med skills that I needed to use when I was doing my comm license and really the critical thinking skills that you learn when you do um, you know, degree in a STEM field. So after university, I joined um, an airline as a cabin crew. Um, I worked for two local airlines. Uh, the other one, I had an opportunity to fly international. And that's when really I started um, taking my flying lessons. I then joined um, the South African Police Services as a helicopter pilot. Um, well, as a cadet first and then helicopter pilot, I worked for them for 10 years. And I think it was the time that I worked for the police that I realized that I actually had a lot of time. Um, there were about five pilots at the unit and we, you could literally spend five, like five days without flying. And when you did fly, you will go out and you will do like 30 minutes of a call out, come back and fly. And the question was, how can I then utilize this time to create value for myself and create value 
for you know for other people and i think that took me onto a you know a sort of a different value and i sat down and i, write, I wrote all the things that i'm passionate about there were millions of them and then i sort of grouped them and i chose top three that i'm really passionate about and i really um looked at them and the top three for me was aviation the first one the second one, which I was in aviation at the time, the second one was academia, and the third one was giving back. Now, the second question for me was, how do I then derive value or give value in those three things that I'm actually passionate about? In aviation, I was already a helicopter pilot flying for the police, so I was giving value and I was driving value. And then the question was then, where do I want to go in that aspect of you know, my, you know, my career? And obviously I wanted to do my ATPL, I wanted to do my fixed wing, and that's exactly what I did. I completed my ATP helicopters, completed um, my fixed wing license, um, started with my instructors, completed my instructors, went on to do um, human factors courses. And now, um, even though the environment is such that, um, you know, there's a lot of negativity in, in, in a sense of what is happening in the industry, I could still derive value. Yes, I'm not flying for an airline. Yes, I'm actually not a lot of charter flyings out there, but I could still derive value and give value by still giving instruction, doing talks in the industry and um, you know, running seminars and modular. So there is still some certain level of continuation. The second thing that I was passionate about was obviously academia. I had already an undergrad degree. So, and I looked at it as how do I then impact the environment that I'm at using the tools that I could get from, you know, education. So I went on to do my PDBA and all those modules, my postgrad, I looked at every module that I was doing. How can I then in, include the aviation industry? I went on to do my MBA. I was supposed to do my PhD, start my PhD this year, but unfortunately I couldn't due to COVID-19. So I'll be continuing next year. The third thing was, how do I then give back, which was the third thing that I was passionate about. And it was then that I started a foundation that, again, it's relevant to the aviation industry. And the foundation is called Girls Fly Program in Africa, where we go to schools and we try to get as many young girls interested in the science, technology, engineering, and arts, and, you know, and maths. And giving back, it's not necessarily, um, you know, being in a nonprofit or giving somebody money. Giving back might just be, you know, opening in a company that has an impact in the industry or sitting in a board where you can make decisions that are, you know, very impactful in the industry. You know, we, I mean, as we sit, one of the biggest challenges in South Africa, we lack the critical skills in managerial, managerial levels where we could really make tangible impact for the better of the industry. So, and what, what happened was when I as well mixed all those three passion of mine, things started opening up that I never thought would open up. Um, I spent the last two years not necessarily doing any three of those things, but a lot of things that are related. I got introduced to technology. I spent a lot of time in the US, whereas I was based in San Francisco and I worked for LinkedIn. Nothing related to, you know, aviation industry. But what I got out of there was technology, learning technology. How do you apply technology to different things, including the aviation industry? And coming back now, I'm using that knowledge to you know, enhance some of the processes of um, the board that I'm currently sitting at. Some of the processes um, I use or tools I use in my instruction um, in the board, in the academia. So the, nothing was really lost. So I want to now, um, sort of answer the last question how do we how do you decide um you know what to do for the next level and i think percy put it in a in a very nice context as well that you shouldn't look at it as something to fall back on it, you still have to be passionate about whatever you're doing because what i find was for me if something didn't work for example there was a point where i was not flying and i it was so easy for me to move to one of those three passions because i was equally passionate about you know, aviation academia and giving back. So it didn't take me a long time to kind of pivot and, um, and do something else. So you cannot just wake up and say, you know what, I want to get certified because it's something that I wanna, that I wanna fall back on. It has to be something that you're passionate about and you have to want to 
make a difference using that particular thing that you know you're passionate about so i want to leave you with something that actually helps me as well that sort of guide me to you know that north star and it's, it's a concept it's a japanese concept ikigai the concept of the reason for being and they look at you know you look at i constantly have to answer these four questions what are you good at you know it, it can be your profession it can be your passion what uh, what is it that you can get paid for because it's important, you know, that you get value and you are able to give value. What is it that the world needs and what you love? And once you answer those questions and you get to sort of an inter, you know, like sort of an intersection of all those four things, that's where you, you find sort of your balance and how you can navigate through different things. So, you know, just to put it in a simple statement is like where your passion and where your talent converges with the things that the world needs and willing to pay for, that's where you're gonna start um, creating value, and that's where you're gonna start giving value, and that's where you're gonna start being able to be agile, flexible in any environment, whether you're a pilot, whether you're in management, you can start using and intersecting those skills to fit whatever context is at the moment. And just one last thing as well, you know, with the aviation industry, it always recovers but we know that when it does recover we're going to need sort of different kind of skills people are going to be looking for people that are versatile that are agile not only as a pilot but they're going to be looking what else what other value can you add to their organizations or to their companies thank you thank you Rufino. that was very insightful um so we're going to have two more speakers after this. We're going to have uh, Sarah, who's one of our graduating students. Um, and then after that, we will have Mike Clark from Absolute Aviation. Um, so Sarah, when you're ready to go. Hi, everyone. So I am an almost graduate and I work for a company known as DocuSynthesis. And we specialize in controlled documents and standard operating procedures in the industry. I started this degree when I was straight out of high school and I've really enjoyed the last three years. So I know Percy mentioned the work-based challenge. So what this is, is it's a subject that spans the three years of the course and you do one module each year, but you build on each module. And it allows you to analyze a real world problem using the academic tools that are placed at your disposal throughout the course. So my work-based challenge was applied to a small aerodrome that my company works with and we help improve their quality and compliance procedures. So we were able to, through this work-based challenge, test some of our own theories and help them create better operating procedures. And with every airport that we worked with, the main documentary and workflow challenges surround data, content and distribution. So ultimately, my, my work-based challenge was shaped into looking at the relationship between aerodrome inspection and risk management. And I found a high burden on management's time due to compliance issues, as well as a need for improvement in data collection and analysis methods. So I feel that the work-based challenge helped me understand these problems better, as well as um, test solutions and give recommendations for our clients. So in terms of return on investment, what I consider that I invested would be tuition fees and time and do not think that it is, does not require investment in time because it does, as well as mentorship from management within my company as well as the companies that we've helped. And my manager stated that um, she felt that I really grew throughout the three years of the course and um, as in terms of how I manage my assignments as well as how I produce work for the company. So I really um, feel that each subject presented by Da Vinci and Status Aviation helped me understand business and aviation holistically, as well as it introduced me to new principles and added more tools to my box as per se that I could use going forward in my career. And the unique nature of the course is it allows you to step back and put aside any bias that you may have and look at problems and solutions from a completely different viewpoint than you would otherwise be used to. So 
my company has grown because we've implemented suggestions throughout different courses that I've found just because every course applies to your own company. And I was able to complete the degree while working. So I gained more skills all round than I would have in a typical degree. And I felt that I could really make a real difference where I was. So when I was choosing this degree, we considered a degree in aviation quality management, but they didn't have one so specific. And then by luck, we stumbled on Da Vinci and Status's collaborated degree and it just was perfect. And we made good friends with everyone in the classes. I'm not sure how workshops will go going forward, but even when we had to do things virtually, it was still fun. And I feel that all the other universities are using lockdown as a excuse to follow on leave here. So I appreciate the fact that all the facilitators are there to help you and guide you on the right direction if you're going on a tangent. And on a random note, the scones at 10.30 on workshop mornings are really good. So, and the new challenges that are always put before you, you feel really fulfilled when you complete assignments. Sometimes it's difficult, sometimes you have less time, but ultimately you finish it and you're more happy that you did it than if you didn't. So I would just say, it's a degree that helps you apply knowledge in a unique way and um, is more personal and applicable to your own workplace and specifically to the aviation industry. Thank you, Sarah. Really appreciate that one. And uh, unfortunately, for the time being, I don't think there'll be any scones um, as we've moved most of the most of the course virtually, uh, especially due to COVID. But uh, hopefully one day we'll, we'll be able to host uh, multiple uh, workshops. And uh, after this, we're going to have our final speaker, which is going to be Mr. Mike Clark, uh, who's from Absolute Aviation. Uh, Mark, Mike. Hi, everybody. Um, can you all hear me? Susie, am I live? Yeah, we can see you and hear you. Okay. Cool. Um, I'm Mike Clark, I'm the managing director of uh, a company at Lanceria called Absolute Aviation. Um, we do aircraft sales, maintenance, management, and basically it's a one-stop shop uh, kind of company. Um, I also have the privilege of being the first graduate, uh, class graduates from the Da Vinci Institute a couple of years ago. And um, uh, yeah, it was just a, a journey. And we, I think Percy mentioned the journey and, and the education process is certainly a, a journey. Um, after this year, I'd like to get hold of Francois again and can I go back to 1A module and learn about the strategies of business and, and the strategies of aviation because I think that that, that has turned uh, everything the last year, the last couple of months has turned aviation on its head. And I think as, as sitting in an MD or a CEO's position in, 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 in aviation in South Africa at the moment, um, it certainly had its, its challenges having to drive teams and drive business with uh, the parameters or the goalposts moving on a constant basis. In that process, I've had to lean a lot on what I learned in uh, the, the Da Vinci process and Da Vinci managing crises and, and, uh, and managing people. And, and I think being uh, having that education background certainly is a differentiator between um, you know, uh, a normal uh, MD and somebody that has gone through the Da Vinci process. And I think that that has stood us in, in time or instead to be able to, to diversify within the business very, very rapidly to be able to, to understand what is, uh, is happening in our, in our industry at the moment. Um, as I said, the CEOs and MDs are making decisions based on the information that is happening on a daily basis, let alone, um, you know, particularly lockdown four and five and to three um, where we didn't know what was coming down in terms of the regulation and in terms of times of the, with the, the market so it has been an exciting challenge but uh, once again uh, I think the word I want to use is that the, the education is a differentiator um, to just being a normal guy on the road um, and, and, and I think that not only is it a, a career enhancer um, and coming back to what Percy said, it, it mustn't be a, 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 a thing just for, you know, a, a fallback on not having a pilot's license or something. It's actually a whole way of life 
that makes you, you, you think differently. Um, I get asked regularly, you know, what was the differentiator and what was it, uh, you know, what, what did I learn out of the whole process? And I said, you know, before I studied, it was I didn't know I didn't know. And uh, after you've completed the degree, it's you now know you don't know. And uh, I think that that is the biggest highlight for me is that you know you don't know, so you've got to go out and find stuff. And the, 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 the way through uh, studying was uh, the way the Da Vinci guys did it was that you were able to go and find what you need to do to make you more effective. Um, the the, the work-based uh, challenge is, is a new concept, uh, well, it was a new concept for Da Vinci in that stage is where all our elective subjects went towards a dissertation that was, that was work-related. And I think that that was one of the biggest uh, value adds that I had within the, within the business was that uh, while I was studying, Sarah, I believe you're also you know, studying and, and working at the same time, which adds a huge challenge. But if you are learning uh, and, and uh, adding value to the business, that is just, uh, it, it kills two birds with one stone and, 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 and it makes everything have relevance. And I think if you, if you have studying where everything has relevance, it just adds uh, to the excitement of, 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 uh, of the challenge. It's a huge sacrifice in terms of family, if you guys have got families and, and work, but I tell you, when you come out the other end, it, it's worth every, every bit of it. So it's a huge financial investment in yourself. Um, and I think if you grow and do that, it, it, uh, it, you, you, you earn it back 10 times over in, 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 in a very short period. So yeah, I think if you guys are contemplating and doing it or getting involved with it, I think uh, it, it, it's certainly something that you won't ever regret doing. Um, I, I did a, a human factors uh, dissertation at the end of it, and that is uh, in management of people. And I think that that has also stood me instead of learning the, the go back to the Maslow's, the Hasbacks, and then the Carl Jung's of the world of understanding people from you know the lowest guys right down to to your your, your fellow directors. And I think that that has also been very very good for me. So, yeah, if there's any doubt, uh, you know, don't just take the plunge, go for it. Cheers, Mike. Okay, are, are, there, are there any questions? Um, yeah, that's what I was going to ask now. If we have any more questions, because uh, Mike was our last speaker. Uh, I know we've been answering them uh, as we went in the text uh, section, but uh, if anybody has any more questions, just let us know, and then we can uh, and see if we can answer it. Uh, in the meantime, Francois, I just wanted to you, if you could address the how we've now, um, I know we've already spoken about it, but just how, how we've now really had to take the classes from uh, physical two-day workshops uh, online again, just so people have an understanding of why that has changed from what uh, Sarah uh, previously done. Yeah, sure thing. Um, maybe I'm just trying to see if I can turn my screen again. For some reason, that button has disappeared. It's not a must, but I thought it'd be nice if I could refer back to the uh, actual content of presentations, but actually no, I'm not seeing that often. But regardless, I think I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, speak on it then. <clears throat> Basically, um, I showed you earlier in that presentation the, the new system that we, um, or new systems and applications that we're using to, to deliver this module. So how it normally worked is that there were workshops before, and this this is the uh, what Sarah was alluding to earlier with the scones and the and the workshops at ten thirty in the morning. Um, we would have full day workshops where um, you know it would carry on for it depends on the module and the, the amount of credits, but it might carry on for two to three days, um, and then you know a lot of discussions would happen there. You know the, the modules be talked through. Um, you know things would be deliberated and that sort of thing in there, and then. And, you know, questions, answer sessions would happen there and all that sort of stuff. So you really, it's, it's almost like a focus session where everyone would get involved and everyone collaborates there. But due to the pandemic that, that uh, hit us all, um, we obviously couldn't do those sessions. Um, that, that poses a health risk and an infection risk. So we used that opportunity to, instead of just doing something temporary, we decided to really rethink the way we, we deliver these modules. So instead of, you know, Trying to fit everything into a two to three day session and, and then the reason for some or part of the reason for for trying to fit everything into, into smaller pieces you know instead of doing classes every day is that aviators by nature don't stay in one place um, they have changing schedules and it's impossible to get a 
full classroom of people that are working professionals in, in most cases, and where a lot of them are pilots, um, you know, cabin crew, or you know, they might be operation be um, busy at an airport, and, and then they have different schedules, and it's always on the go. It's very difficult to get a, a groups like that into a class together. Um, so it's it's almost impossible to to present this module as a uh, a full time you know class from Monday to Friday every week for the year um, type of module. So we did it in workshops where people could actually book leave and then come in. Um, you know, so it's planned well in advance, and that's how we did it before. But we we obviously have to achieve the same sort of thing. We we wanted to achieve that collaboration between students, between facilitators. We wanted to achieve that same discussion, um, but we also wanted to make it possible for for working professionals to attend. So. The way we've set it up is, is you know, we, we, we've now spread it across a six to eight week period. So we, we don't have the geographical issue. So normally you'd have to take leave and you'd have to, you know, everyone would have to come from wherever they are to a central location. So now with the online system, we don't have the geographical issue. So it now becomes easier to do um, sessions every week, for example, because if you, for example, are in Cape Town or if you um, somewhere and you still wanted to attend the discussions, you, you didn't have to fly down or up to Pretoria or, or Johannesburg rather. Um, so we don't have that geographical issue. So we, we've sort of spread the sessions out so that you have um, continuous contact with, with your, your fellow students and your facilitator. Where we have those, uh, you know, quote unquote face-to-face -face discussions, you know, like Zoom discussions and, and that sort of thing. But then um, with the, application with the communications platform that I was, I was uh, showing earlier, um, you know, we, we're constantly engaging on this. So it's constantly discussions, chats, questions and answers. You know, a student will pop me a message and I'll, I'll see it come up on my phone and then when I've, when I've got a chance I'll quickly answer. So they'll, they'll be able to, while they're working on a sign, just quickly take a screenshot, check something with me, you know, you know, is this the right way of doing it, that sort of thing. So that, that constant engagement, there's, there's um, it's a central place where students can communicate with each other. So the students share ideas on there where they, you know, they've got maybe an idea for how to approach an assessment and then um, they can check that with the other students and ask them, you know, what are you guys doing? So it, it simulates that collaborative um, you know, ethos and that, that, that collaboration that we used to get from the face-to-face -face sessions. And I think it almost does it better in the sense that there's, there's more engagement, there's more contact time. Um, you know, we're almost constantly engaged now with each other and with, with you know, students are constantly chatting with each other. Obviously, I mean, um, some people prefer the face-to-face -face sessions and there's a possibility that we might incorporate some of those aspects again in future, but obviously right now that's not possible. And we really want to use this, and, and this is part of what we at least try to teach in the module is that, um, you know, that, we want to adapt and, and, and use these types of challenges and scenarios and, and, and really convert them and leverage them into um, something even better. So what we hope to achieve here is that, that you know, COVID didn't just happen to us and we, we just had to now change the way we, we, we do things. I think we are trying to find a way that's even better than the way we did it before. So that once this pandemic is over, um, we don't have to change back. You know, we, we, we've now moved forward. So that's, that's really the intention here. So, these online sessions, the the delivery method that we that I've presented before, uh, it's not just a reactionary thing. Um, we actually had discussions about moving some of the more continuous contact um, style things um, before the COVID or the, the pandemic actually happened. So, what we really want to achieve is to have this system and this delivery method in such a way that this will be the best method. This will be the one that the students love. Um, we were constantly also taking feedback from students and, and what they like, what they don't like about it, and. Um, we're constantly evolving as well. That, that's part of what we teach as well. As, as, as in aviation, we, we constantly need to move forward. We constantly need to evolve and to, and to improve things because that's how we survive and thrive as an industry. So that's really the, um, you know, just sort of, sort of the challenges we faced with the, with the pandemic, obviously the contact time, but um, we're not using that as an excuse. Um, we're going to use this to make something even better. Um, and I think from the responses that I've personally received from students, they, you know, most of them are loving it. Um, they like the new method just because they can, they, they've got access, you know, it's not, you don't, you don't wait for a workshop to, to try and answer your questions. You can, according to your own schedule, you can then pose questions that can get answered. You can stay in touch. You can, um, you know, just work through it in that sense. I think that that's advantageous for most people in the industry because, um, I'm sure as many of the attendees here and, and uh, many of you are actually employed at the moment or, or are working for an organization or have other commitments at least. Um, 
So it helps to have that availability where okay, you might not be able, you might not be available in the morning, but you can come back at six o'clock this afternoon and focus a bit on your studies. And that having a platform like this available where everything's accessible when you need it, um, if you need it, I think is really advantageous. I think from that sense, I, I don't want this to see this, or I don't want it to be presented or to, to come across as a compromise. This is really an improvement to, to our delivery method that we've we implemented. Cool. Thank you, Francois. And then we've got a uh, hand raised from Hillary. Uh, Hillary? Hillary, yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, this is Hillary. And uh, can you can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. My uh, concern is um, I've been in aviation for the last uh, 11 years. And I've worked from both the little airlines, charters, United Nations, as well as the big airlines. I currently work for Qatar Airways. So my biggest concern is at the moment we've been concentrating more on management. And when it comes to the employment bit of it, we get people who are just academic with managerial skills, but then whatever you need to put on the job in terms of experience is lacking. So I would really appreciate if, or rather, not, I'm not suggesting, but my question is, would you rather look at this particular course and combine it with logistics? Because that is where it's most, um, let's, let's say marketable. Because we get graduates in my field, I've got doctors, I've got engineers. I work in the airline operation control center. So we do all these things. So you get to a point whereby you work with engineers, you work with people who've done chemical engineering and all these other fields. Rarely do we have pilots unless they're airline dispatchers. So are you looking at bringing in the logistics part in terms of practicality. Okay, Percy, I think you'll take that one. Hi, Hilary. Um, this is a very good point. Um, it's also one of the main reasons why we moved this qualification from being purely pilot focused to actually being uh, uh, focused on the broader management aspect because part of our well, one of the first modules in fact i think it's the introductory module looks at the entire value chain of aviation and um specifically you know what the roles are of the other people in the industry um, because uh, you need to learn what they are doing in order to effectively work with them um so uh, during this process of sort of redesigning the qualification at a later stage uh, um, where we where we brought in uh, this uh, value chain approach. Um, the whole purpose of that was specifically to 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 pull in people from the from the, the other sectors, so that when we do have these engagements with the students, that you actually have um, experience from the other um, areas also come to the table. Um, what uh, uh, again, uh, just to touch on that workplace challenge mod module again. Um, wh what we do then find is that because we have people from different areas of aviation, um, they, you actually do get exposure to work with, uh, with the managers and the, well, the, call it future managers, but we do have a lot of people who are employed currently in, in uh, different areas that do, do partake in this qualification. So um, we don't just look at the academic background specifically for pilots. We, we look at the entire value chain how the um, different players participate. And then also it's up to you as a student to, when you do your assignments, uh, the way that the assignments are structured is you, you, you apply um, the learning to your specific working environment. So um, it's up to you to also uh, apply that to the space that you're uh, particularly um, interested in or where you are working. So again, then, then the, the knowledge then gets applied to, if, if in your instance, like you were saying, if you want to work with logistics or if you work in the logistics side, then your, your knowledge will be um, 
will be more close related to uh, to the logistics um, aspect of it. I hope that answers your question. So if I can just add one small comment, is that um, you know, to your point, this model is actually not possible without practical application. It's part of the requirement of the module. So everything that you do, all the assessments that you do are practically based. It's based on your organization or your chosen organization. You actually have to apply the principles um, you know, of each module, all the, all the different content. And like you said, it's, it's, it's broadly based. It covers all the different aspects of aviation. So you'll be addressing all the different parts of aviation. You, you'll be getting a much bigger perspective. Um, you know, so to that point, it's not just a pilot focus or a specific perspective focus. And like I said, it's not just a work-based challenge, even that, that you apply these principles. Every single assessment, you're expected to apply um, essentially your assessment and, and those answers and, and what you're doing um, always. It's a requirement of each and every assessment. So it's, it's really a practical application-based thing. We, we don't fall into that trap of, at least we do everything in our power not to fall into the trap of, of um, producing academic um, students who have no real world um, use. You know, it's, it's very much focused on trying to get people who are, are useful in the real world, um, backed with real academic knowledge and credible um, you know, information and knowledge and, and to be valuable members of society. So that, that's really our focus. So I just wanted to mention that it's actually not possible to do this degree without uh, getting that practical side. Uh, doesn't look like we have any more questions after this. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all our panelists. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Rafiq. And Mario had to shoot off a bit earlier. I'd like to, if anybody has uh, any more questions or queries, please go check out our website, statusaviation.co.za under the education uh, banner. And you just please fill in the form and let us know what you'd like to know and we'll respond to that as soon as we can. Uh, so thank you everyone for attending and hope to see you soon. Thanks guys, have a good day. Thanks everyone. Thanks, thanks everyone. Bye.